The 2024 hurricane season could be one of the most active along the Texas coast in years. And with Houston ranking as one of the fastest growing metros in the U.S., there are a lot of people moving here who don't know the ins and outs. But even if you're a native, getting caught off guard by just one storm can be devastating. The KPRC2 Storm Tracker team is helping you make sure your family and your home are ready. From the studios of KPRC2, sponsored by Quality Home Products of Texas, Houston Window Experts, and BKV Energy, this is the Hurricane and Flood Survival Guide. After a fairly quiet year for the Texas coast in 2023, with only one tropical storm landfall, we could be looking at a very different picture heading into the 2024 season. Thank you for joining us. I'm Anthony Giannis. We've already seen major weather events this year, including two in less than a month. In late April and early May, communities along the Trinity River saw water rise up to and sometimes inside their homes after a tornado and downpours moved through. Several counties declared a state of disaster, and just weeks later, a devastating storm, including both a tornado and a derecho, caused damage from Waller to downtown Houston. Eight people died at the peak of the storm's aftermath. More than a million people were without power. For some, it took a week to restore electricity. Tonight, we're exploring the lessons learned from past weather events and how Southeast Texas is using it all to move forward. So let's start from the beginning. What kind of season are we expecting this year? It is predicted to be a busy hurricane season. In fact, I've put up three different forecasts here. One from Weatherbell, who are close partners with that say there could be 25 to 30 named storms, 14 to 16 hurricanes, six to eight major storms. CSU, which is really uh, the, the group, Colorado State University has been doing hurricane forecasting for decades is coming up with 23 named storms, 11 hurricanes, five major. NOAA has never had, the National Hurricane Center, had a forecast that's been this high. 17 to 25, 8 to 13 hurricanes, 4 to 7 major storms. Notice how this compares to average, 14, 7, and 3. So why? What's the reason? Well, when you look currently at what's going on in the tropics, things are nice and quiet, but this is one of the keys is that we have transitioned from an El Nino season to a La Nina. So what you're seeing here with the sea surface temperature anomaly these are the below average temperatures off the coast of South America. That is just a, uh, a staple of what La Nina looks like. But when you get a La Nina, typically what you have are you have warmer than average temperatures in the Gulf, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic. And here we are early hurricane season and we're already seeing that. In fact, when you look at the sea surface temperatures from the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean to the Atlantic, already what you're seeing is water temperatures in the mid 80s from the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. And these are temperatures you would usually only see late July, early August, and already we're there. And here's the last element. This is the ocean heat content. How warm is the water at depth? And so those were all the surface temperatures, but at depth, you're seeing this area in the Caribbean starting to go into the loop current here into the Gulf of Mexico, where you have temperatures that are plus 80 degrees now going deeper. So what that means is when a storm starts to form and go over these areas, it can rapidly intensify, and the waters are so warm right now, it is serving as fuel for these storms not only to form, but to intensify rapidly, and we're hardly into the hurricane season. Okay, so now let's talk about the ingredients that you need to be able to create a tropical storm or even a hurricane. One of the most important is this right here. You have to have water temperatures of at least 80 degrees. We've certainly got plenty of that in the Gulf of Mexico. And this year in particular, both the Atlantic and the Caribbean have been starting warmer sea surface temperatures than we've seen in quite some time. So that ingredient is there. So what happens is, is that warm air begins to rise. That rising air causes storms and clouds to form. Very similar to what you would see on a summer afternoon as we start to get the thunderstorms moving through our area. As that process repeats itself, the outside air starts to rush in to replace that air that's rising. That continual rising motion aids in additional storm development. They get bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually you start to get a very strong upward motion and you're pulling in air from all sides. And that's what creates this sort of upward spin around an area of low pressure at the center of the storm. So let's take a hurricane and let's slice it in half. So what we're looking at in particular is that area of low pressure that is swirling at the surface creates that rising motion in the thunderstorms. And it's creating that little outward effect. 
Conversely, at the top of the storm, an area of high pressure starts to develop. That starts to create a sinking air effect, which results in clearer skies. Remember, high pressure compresses and dries out the air. So while the thunderstorm clusters are swirling around the center of that storm, the eye, the clear part of the storm, is created by that area of high pressure right at the top. And that's when we start tracking things here at the Storm Tracker 2 Weather Center for you and your family. Now let's get over to meteorologist Aji Aswad. The Gulf Coast is no stranger to the wrath of tropical storms and hurricanes. Home developers in Surfside are adapting by building to new heights. It's like your own slice of paradise out here. A slice of paradise that Garrett Davison and his family have built beach houses on and lived on for generations. What was it like? You said you grew up here on Surfside. What was it like growing up? It's almost every day is like a vacation. And the part of the vacation comes along with hurricane season. So is that something that you've gotten used to? Uh, you kind of get used to not knowing if a storm's going to come and just knowing that everything you own is disposable, basically. Surfside has been in the path of storms like Rita, Harvey, and Nicholas, damaging homes and even eroding important dune systems that protect property from being one with the shoreline. Are we building better? Absolutely, and a lot more is going into these houses than previously. From the windows to the foundation, it's designed with storms in mind. The standards, I should say, yes. for building, this would have been a little lower. Absolutely, so this foundation is about four foot above sea level, and um, this one's 17, so we're, we're about 13 out, give or take. And so you see a lot more steel in the, these buildings. And then the, the double stringer system, we used to use single stringer systems. So you're seeing a lot more wood. And then the spacing on these are on 12s. We used to be able to do 16. So you're seeing a lot more wood and a lot more bolting systems uh, in this house. More material to stand up to tropical force winds and rains cost builders and buyers a pretty penny. But the cost of safety is a price tag that is priceless. What is that feeling of completion like? It, it's really nice to drive by a project that you've finished successfully. And then it's, it's also a good feeling after a storm to come back and see that that project is still there. So that's why we build to such high standards. We want to make sure that those houses are there a long time. We are living in a warming world. In fact, year after year, our sea surface temperature in the Atlantic, it's setting records, and that includes this year as well. But what does that mean for our tropical season? Well, bottom line, it's getting worse. We're seeing more storms, stronger winds, heavier rainfall and higher storm surge. And all of this is correlated to our warming world. Let's start with an increased number of storms. Last year, we saw 20 named storms. That was the fourth highest total since 1950. On average, we only see 14 named storms. And if you're curious, the highest number, that was within the last five years. In 2020, we saw an astonishing 30 named storms in the Atlantic Basin. Unfortunately, we're not just seeing more storms, we're seeing stronger winds with these storms. When you have warm water, it acts as fuel and energy, and this causes hurricanes to rapidly intensify. This is gonna be a trend as we go through the next several decades. We mentioned that we see heavier rainfall, and that actually has to do with the warm air above the ocean water. For every one degree increase in Fahrenheit for our air, we can hold 4% more water vapor. This translates to heavier rainfall and more flooding during a hurricane. As for our higher storm surge, we have melting ice on the poles and that's causing our sea level to rise, not just globally, but even here in Texas. This is Galveston Pier 21. From 1950 to today, we've seen our sea level rise by 20 inches. This means when we have storm surge, it's even more enhanced than what we've seen in the past. So the big picture is that we are living in a warming world. Unfortunately, that does mean our hurricanes will be more frequent and more intense, which is why now more than ever, it's important for you and your family to be prepared. Each and every hurricane is different from the size, the hazards it brings, and how it impacts a region. So up next, we're looking at how a different storm could bring devastating impacts to our home. 
Plus, we're paying more for just about everything, including the essentials for our own hurricane kits. But there are ways to keep your costs down without sacrificing safety. Brittany Bagley showing you how to shop smarter this hurricane season. And as we head to break, here's a quick tip. Now is the time to double check your family's communication plan. As we've seen before, a strong storm can knock out Wi-Fi and cell connections for days. So make sure your household has a plan to meet up and a backup way to get word to loved ones out of town. There's no better tool in our arsenal to help understand future storms than to look at past hurricanes. Each and every tropical system is different. They're different in size. They have different impacts and they can affect regions differently. KPRC2's Gage Golding is along the southwest coast of Florida where Hurricane Ian made landfall in 2022. It's the most recent major hurricane to hit a big metro. Tonight, he reports how a storm like Ian could be much different than what we've seen recently. Our building was swaying back and forth. There was smoke coming up the stairwell. It was heartbreaking flying over people with dogs and children and they're waiting for help. Where we're standing right now probably had 10 feet of storm surge. It has been nearly two years since Hurricane Ian hit Southwest Florida, yet here in the town center of Fort Myers Beach, the damage can be seen just about anywhere you look. Businesses that are still struggling to reopen with the slow rebuilding process and the island's iconic pier still untouched. Hurricane Ian delivered a devastating double punch to Southwest Florida. Catastrophic category five winds and historic storm surge, an incredibly damaging and deadly combination, but much different than what we saw here in Houston during Hurricane Harvey. Harvey was, I think, a slightly weaker storm. Um, but they obviously had two very different kind of the effects. Ian and Harvey, two very different hurricanes impacting two vastly different areas, but both having the same outcome utter devastation. This bullseye of 40 inches of rain affecting millions of people. While Houston was spared the worst of Harvey's wind and storm surge, we're just as prone to a catastrophic impact from a storm just like Ian. You have all this water that's pulled up in front of the storm, and then once you get up into that step, it exacerbates. We've seen that exact scenario play out before with Hurricane Ike and with other past hurricanes far before modern technology. We found some historic records of 20 feet for the, I think it was the 1900 Galveston storm. But today we have technology, including this, a $100,000 drone. The drone and LiDAR sensor on the bottom are being used to map the Florida Gulf Coast before, immediately after, and years following Hurricane Ian. The mapping we're doing sort of reveals vulnerabilities along the coast. Vulnerabilities like this, areas of the beach badly eroded by storm surge, which can undermine buildings, leading to even more destruction. The storm surge actually causes problems twice, once coming in, the so-called flood surge, and once going out, the ebb surge and that returning water created oh, horrendous conditions. The worst of the erosion is near the beach access points, purposeful cuts and dunes which are meant to protect us. While some researchers use technology, others are tapping into Mother Nature's wisdom. Nature does more in resilience than it does in resistance. Wynn Everham from the Water School at Florida Gulf Coast University is studying how nature handles hurricanes. One of the answers is that different species handle it in different ways. We had Donna in 60. We, 44 years later, had Charlie. 11 years later, we had Irma. Five years later, we had Ian. A trend that keeps first responders busier and busier. Texas A&M Task Force One is by far the busiest team in the country. Director Jeff Saunders manages this $7 million cache of equipment. He's been to every major hurricane in the last 20 years, including both Ian and Harvey. Is there an easier type of hurricane to respond to? one that goes into non-populated areas. Whether it's historic rains from Harvey or inundating storm surge from Ian. It's still going to involve the same amount of search and rescue. The same goes for law enforcement. There's people out here waving for help, trying to get out of These pilots with the Lee County Sheriff's Office flying us today were the first in the sky after Hurricane Ian. And there are things still like actively burning down. Even the region's leading law enforcement agency is learning lessons and sharing what they learned with other departments. Every single day at noon, I delivered 
updates to our citizens. First responders had to evacuate themselves as Ian bore down on Southwest Florida, leaving people who refused to evacuate in their homes, where many wouldn't make it. Storm surge is very real, and it killed a lot of people. On the island of Fort Myers Beach, recovery and rebuilding is everywhere you look, but it took a while to get here. On an island where one third of the buildings were destroyed and not a single vehicle survived, residents were stranded off the island. Make sure you have a really good plan, not only to get out away from the storm, but to be able to come back to your community after the storm. But their biggest issue is out of Vice Mayor Jim Adderholt's hands. It's an issue we're dealing with right here in Houston. Our primary uh, obstacle to recovery has been the insurance companies. And I think for your folks and your, your, your viewers in Texas, they need to be prepared for the insurance industry to be non-responsive. With every hurricane comes a new set of lessons we can all learn from, from Florida to Texas. Each time a community is knocked down, it can help another build back quicker and stronger. On Fort Myers Beach, Florida, Gage Golding, KPRC 2 News. I think most of us are familiar with how hurricanes are rated. We have categories one through five describing a storm's intensity. The scale was developed in the early 1970s by Herbert Saffer and Robert Simpson, the then director of the National Hurricane Center. At the time, there was no way to assess the potential damage from winds greater than 75 miles per hour. So the pair created the Saffer Simpson wind scale. Here's what the scale means. A hurricane starts at category one strength with winds of 74 to 96 miles per hour. This creates scattered wind damage. Now category two storms have wind speeds of 96 to 110 miles per hour. These are very dangerous winds creating moderate damage. Ike in 2008 was a category two storm. Now the major hurricanes start at category three and above. These bring extensive damage with winds 111 to 129 miles per hour. Alicia from 1983 was a category three. Category four storms have winds of 130 to 156 miles per hour. Carla in 1961 was an example of this catastrophic storm. Finally, there are Cat 5 storms with consistent wind speeds greater than 157 miles per hour. And you can see how powerful these winds are. But there's an issue. Here's the issue. Everything I've talked about so far at the Sanford Simpson scale, the impacts go beyond wind. All I've mentioned so far are winds. There's storm surge, there's flooding, and even recently there's been enough of a controversy to say, hey, storms are getting stronger. There should be a category six with 192 mile per hour winds and above. So our partners that we work with at weatherbell.com say what we should be transitioning to, and probably won't happen, but what we should be transitioning to is what's called a power and impact scale. So they use the Saffir Simpson scale as the foundation. But what's the pressure tendency of a storm? Is it getting higher, which means the storm's weakening? Or is it lowering, which means the storm is strengthening? What's the radius of the winds? Is this a large storm or is it a small storm? A Cat 4 or Charlie in 2004 is an example of a small storm, but you have Sandy, for example, with winds going out 200 miles that was not even really rated a tropical system at the time. They would rate that a highly strong storm. How powerful and impactful will the storm be? Much more than what are only the winds. That's what they're saying they should, what they'd like to do right now. Nothing is changing with how storms are rated. Houston is heading into this hurricane season with a new mayor at the helm for the first time in years. And John Whitmire's approach may be very different. Everyone has to use their years of training, their years of relationships. Still ahead, I'm sitting down with him to talk about the disasters he's already seen during his time in City Hall and how he's preparing for the upcoming months. And here's a hurricane fact you may not know. During tropical systems, the vast majority of deaths come from either drowning or being hit by wind-blown debris. After the storm passes, the most common causes of death and injury include electrocution, falling trees, and infections. Knowing your evacuation zone is one of the key parts of hurricane preparedness. This is the map of the Houston area flood zones. Families in the purple zone closest to the coast will be the first to be told to evacuate. Now, if the storm is strong enough, expect the yellow zone to get the evacuation order next, followed by the green and the orange zones. It is important to note that a big part of our region is not in an evacuation zone and would be encouraged not 
to get out on the road. We know it's a lot to take in. So we posted this map on click2houston.com so you can get a closer look at it. It's part of our digital hurricane survival guide. Whether it's a hurricane or a strong storm, we have seen the power go out in the Houston area for families days at a time, if not longer. That's where a generator can come in. It can keep the lights on, but we want to be sure you are staying safe when you're using it. And we are joined now by Andy Johns. He is assistant sales manager with Quality Home Products of Texas. All right, we're talking generators today. Andy, when families are considering a generator mm -hmm. for their home, what are some things they should factor in? The biggest thing is, of course, going to be safety and just making sure that the generator can run the load that you're trying to run, which would be the size of the house. Uh, but the biggest mistakes that we see made is just not having the proper clearance and requirements around the generator. Uh, for example, you want to make sure that you're five feet from any kind of vents, like especially even in the attic. Uh, any kind of dryer vents, windows, any kind of opening in the house, you want to make sure you have five feet because this is going to produce carbon monoxide. It's run by natural gas, which obviously can be really dangerous if that carbon monoxide is getting into the house. Uh, so proper clearance is really important. Also from this side, this is where your exhaust is going to blow out. So that is hot air that's blowing out of the engine. So you want to make sure that you're at least five feet from any kind of flammable material like the fence. Uh, you don't want to plant any kind of bushes beside it. You don't want it to be blowing towards the house because that's going to be a fire hazard. Obviously, Quality Home Products of Texas, y'all have been in business for a long time. And when it comes to choosing an installer to put a generator, either a standby generator or to purchase a portable generator from for your home, uh, you want to go with a pro. Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you definitely want to make sure all the requirements that I was telling you about, uh, you want to make sure you go with someone reputable that knows how these need to be placed. Yeah, comfort is one thing. Obviously, we want to keep the lights on during a storm, but safety is paramount. Andy Johns, thank you so much for thank spending you. time with us today. Too often families leave behind their pets as they evacuate. How you should start preparing now to make sure every creature in your home gets out safely. And here's a preparation tip most people forget. The aftermath of a tropical system usually brings a torrent of bugs. Mosquitoes thrive in the dampness and humidity of the storm's aftermath. So make sure you have insect repellent ready. When it comes to having a plan in place, making sure your whole family is ready for a hurricane is key. And we're not just talking about people. Pets need an evacuation plan too. After all, you don't want to leave these guys behind, do you? KPRC2's Lisa Hernandez is at the Houston SPCA with what you need to know to keep your animals safe. Hey, yeah, guys, we want to talk about pet preparedness now that we are fully into hurricane season. Joining us to talk about it right now is Julie Kensto with the Houston SPCA. We are in a, par a portion of your lovely shelter here off yes. Old Katy Road. Yes. Uh, thanks for talking about this with us. It's so important. We just saw a ton of awful wind and rain, um, two, two rounds of it, really. You guys were nearly deployed. How important is it, Julie, for folks to be prepared? Oh, gosh. You know, if... if People are new to Houston, mm -hmm. please listen up. Take a moment and think about Hurricane Harvey. Think about the recent storms a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. We were not expecting that. Right. And it happens. And so this hurricane season, we don't know, right? So it's really, really important to have everything done. Just check it off your list. You can get a, a really big crate, get a crate, that was the number one thing that I think you need to do like right now Yes, is get them acclimated. Okay, so we have got Mr. Hercules. Yeah. He's gonna demonstrate th what it is to be crate ready. When you're at home, you can put dog treats in there, let them wander in there during the day mm -hmm. to go in there. Mm -hmm. Maybe let them take their time mm -hmm. to just get used to the crate. If you have to leave an emergency, or even if you don't, and it is thundering and storming outside and your dog is, or your cat is really, really nervous yeah. and you're worried about them dashing out the door, mm -hmm. you can put them in the crate, 
put some of their toys, put some of their favorite treats in there. It's really going to help them and it's also gonna help you because that's one less thing that you have to be stressed about. The Houston SPCA also has a checklist of supplies to have at the ready in case you need to evacuate, which includes your pet's medication, a two week supply of food, water, treats, a pet first aid kit, as well as your pet's vaccination record printed out and ready to go. Jolly Kunstall, thank you so much. Sure. Houston SPCA for hosting us today and teaching us all about pet readiness. We appreciate it. There's a new mayor at the helm in Houston. I think we need all hands on deck. I, one reason I was excited to, to talk to you is to let Houstonians, the greater Houston community, realize this is serious. And coming up, we sit down with John Whitmire for a look at how his past experience is bringing a new philosophy to the job. And did you know, between 1980 and this season, 81 tropical or subtropical systems have affected Texas? The most active month for storms in Texas during that time was September, which has seen 21 systems hit the state since 1980. This hurricane season is John Whitmire's first as mayor of Houston, but not his first helping the city deal with the aftermath of storms and flooding. And he says he's already learning lessons. We sat down together to talk about his approach to leading the city through emergencies. We really wanted to talk to you about your first hurricane season here and it's expected to be a busy one. It's expected to be an impactful one. I think we need all hands on deck. I, one reason I was excited to, to talk to you is to let Houstonians, the greater Houston community, realize this is serious. And everyone needs to personally, their families get prepared because the city's getting prepared. And certainly our recent storms has given us an opportunity to dust off all of our best tools and resources. I only learned during the recent storm that our multi-service centers do not have generators. So when you refer people to a multi-service center or we try to gear up as a cooling center and the power's out to the multi-service center, no generators. So I've begun talking to the federal government, FEMA, and others about helping us with generations. Let's talk about your role now. What, how do you view your role as mayor during the season, where does like hurricane preparedness rank? With you were just telling me your job it, when you come in, it's it's everything you've done in the past in, in government, but on steroids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It so, is be, being the mayor of Houston is a challenge. It's it's a hard job. I prepared my whole adult life for it as as a legislator for over fifty years. The uh, the relationships working with the county. We've got county commissioners started calling me the night of the storm. We're bringing our resources from the outside uh, Houston into the city of Houston in their precincts. The unincorporated areas have resources. We're bringing our trucks and crews. Uh, my role is to make sure that it's running on time, to make certain that I can get the department heads the resources they need. Houston more prepared for a storm like Harvey? We know the names of the storms and we know the damage and they're, they're not our friends. So what we have to do is be prepared uh, and be ready for the unexpected. And, and you do that by having the resources. We have much, much mobility and rescue vehicles today than we did prior to Harvey. A lot of federal funds have come down, uh, FEMA funding. So I just think, and, and that's the, the benefit of your conversation with me is to let everybody know we all have a responsibility to play. Certainly I have one and we'll be held accountable. And it's amazing, just a little variation off path will, have, will yeah. change the impact it's totally, everything. totally. It's everything. But we don't want a, a major storm to hit Houston directly. Yeah. But we're, we'll be prepared, we'll reach out. You know, it, what it does, it shows how great Houston is to look out for one another, our unity. We're proud of our diversity, our separate communities, their culture, their language. But when we get in these crisis situations, we become Houstonians. Hurricane kits are an essential every year. And whether you're just building it or adding and replacing items, you're probably paying more this year than last year. It's Brittany Bagley's first hurricane season as a member of the Storm Tracker 2 weather team. So let's go along with her as she looks for the most cost-efficient way to keep yourself and your family safe. 
And how much is it gonna cost you to keep you and your family safe? If a hurricane knocks out your power for days. From the Dollar Tree to H-E-B, your weather team is looking out for you. From safety all the way down to the bottom line. Here is a gallon of water. They say you want a gallon of water per person per day, $1.25. We're taking it, it's a good deal. H-E-B, I found a gallon of water for $1.34. Dollar Tree was $1.25, so it's not that big of a difference. You could always stockpile your water so that you can slowly prepare for hurricane season. Next, we're gonna need non-perishable food. Tuna for $1.25, it's gonna keep you full, protein, and help you get through the storm. Then we went to H-E-B to check out deals on higher priced items. Jerky is a fan favorite, but it's also very expensive, which makes stockpiling a great option for you. When you look for those in-store coupons, you can pretty much save money on anything. Next on our list, battery and chargers, starting at the Dollar Tree. Hurricane kit is not complete without flashlights and batteries. And while my list does say cell phone chargers, I didn't really find that here, but I did find some cell phone wires which could help with that portable charger. So we went straight to HEB to try to find the rest. We have name brand, we have store brand, and of course I was excited to see this, cell phone chargers to help keep you powered and safe during the storm while you get your groceries. Can't forget about first aid kits when we think about preparing for the next hurricane. You can't beat a dollar cooler, especially when it comes to your medications and first aid kits. You can see some first aid kits can cost you 50, 60, 70 dollars. We have do-it-yourself kits to help save you a little time stress and frustration before the storm. Then we went to H-E-B to try to find a kit. First aid kits, they can be kind of expensive, so always look for ones that are on sale. And if you have apps like Ibotta, those coupon apps can actually help you save a little bit more too. Then I asked each store for a little secret when it comes to preparing for your hurricane, starting with the Dollar Tree. And according to the staff, this is one of the hottest items people come for. This is the disposable washcloths here. You can see they offer a whole bunch of different varieties for you, even body wash, something to think about as you prepare for the storm. Let's talk about coolers, because we all know these babies can be really hard to find during hurricane season, and they're kind of expensive. But the folks at HEB say, buy your coolers around the holidays. They always have a sale, so you're gonna save money you're gonna enjoy those holidays with cooler drinks and be prepared during hurricane season. So overall, after checking both stores, they both have some great options. Check the Dollar Tree to save money on name brand items, but if you're looking to save money, H-E-B store brand items might be a little bit cheaper for you. But if you're living paycheck to paycheck and on a budget, Dollar Tree may help you while you're waiting for the next payday. When storms hit, one of the most valuable resources to have is our KPRC2 Storm Tracker app. When you open it up, you'll first see current conditions for your location and a live radar that's interactive and customizable. So right now I'm showing you current precipitation, but I can toggle it to also show future cast, temperatures, even current traffic. Now on our app, you'll also be able to see the hour by hour forecast that gets updated by our meteorologists. You can also watch our live streams here too. And this is where we analyze storms in real time. Now this is actually one of my favorite parts of the app because when the power goes out and your TV won't turn on, you can still get the life-saving information through the app. Just remember to keep your devices charged. You can customize your app however you want to get notifications for watches, warnings, and advisories that will get sent directly to your phone. And of course, nothing is more powerful than seeing exactly what's happening in your neighborhood. This is why we've made it really easy to access click to pins where you can upload your own photos and you can see photo shares from your neighbors. Downloading this app is simple. Just search KPRC in your app store and download the Storm Tracker 2 app, which is free on all app stores. We want to thank you for joining us now and throughout the hurricane season. Our team is committed to keeping you informed on KPRC2, KPRC2 Plus, Click2Houston.com, and our Storm Tracker Weather app. And if you haven't already, download this year's Hurricane Flood and Survival Guide now on Click2Houston.com. Until next time, I'm Anthony Yannis.